Let me begin this sermon with this question. Who is the Holy Spirit? Who, who do you think the Holy Spirit is? Do you, do you think of him maybe as some kind of force out there? Do you think of him as, as maybe some, something that you're like, well, let's just not think about that part. Maybe even me saying that question, who is the Holy Spirit? You're like, oh no. Christians are about to do that weird Christian thing again. <laughs> Where's the door, right? Or maybe you're like, finally, Pastor John, about time we talked about the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? What are the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you? Jesus, before he leaves, tells his apostles that it's better that he's leaving. That those who come after who get the spirit are better than those who get to live even shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. How wild is that? This is Jesus in John 16. Jesus says these words. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Whoever the Holy Spirit is, life with the Holy Spirit is so good, so powerful, so meaningful, that it's better than with Jesus Christ himself. What an amazing thing that is. So who is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is one of the three persons of the Trinity. As Christians, we believe in one God and three persons. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Equal in power, equal in authority, equal in their godhood. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting about the, the three persons of the Trinity. It's, it's been, it's been uh, by some kind of claimed that different parts of, different types of Christians really focus on one of the three persons. It's been claimed that those kind of from the more liturgical background, like Roman Catholic or Anglican or Orthodox, like, like they tend to focus on the, God the Father. It's been claimed that evangelicals tend to focus on God the Son, Jesus Christ. And that charismatics or Pentecostals tend to focus on God the Spirit. Now, whatever truth there is in that, we all must agree that we don't just weren't worship one God in one person. We worship one God in three persons. And so if we want to know God, we want to know the fullness of the triune God. And that's the heartbeat of this sermon series, which we're calling Unveiled. Unveiled. Our heartbeat is that as we explore six of the roles of the Holy Spirit, we would get to know and understand the Holy Spirit better. That we would even we would even come to understand and taste a little bit of what Jesus is talking about when he says it's better for you to have the Spirit of God than actually have me alongside you. How can that be? We're going to talk about six roles over the next six weeks. And today we begin with this role. The Holy Spirit is a gift giver. The Holy Spirit is a gift giver. Wherever the Holy Spirit comes, he comes bringing gifts. He's like the, you know, you, you, ho hopefully you have this person in your family that shows up on Christmas Day. Maybe it's grandma and grandpa. And they pop the trunk and, poof, you know, like the gifts are like flowing out, right? Maybe it's an uncle. Maybe it's a friend. Of the Holy Spirit comes bearing gifts and he loves to give gifts. It's in his nature to give gifts. The Spirit of God is a gift giver. Now, as we open up our passage today in 1 Corinthians 12, I want to provide a little bit of context about kind of what is happening in the background of, at the Church of Corinth here. Now, the Church of Corinth was aware that the Spirit of God had given them gifts, but they had begun to misunderstand the purpose of those gifts. They'd really kind of, some of them had, had, had used those gifts to kind of put themselves in a position over people, to kind of exalt themselves. Other people were envious of other gifts. 
There were kind of a class of gifts, of, of miraculous gifts, like especially the gift of tongues that were like looked up to, like, oh, those are the really special spiritual people up there. And Paul writes to correct them. No, 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 no. The Spirit of God has come to give you gifts, and those gifts are for the building up of the people of God. They're, they're to strengthen the family of God in love. This is the purpose of gifts. It's for the common good. So let's pick up in 1 Corinthians 12, and let's begin to read. Verse 4. There are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. I'll pause right there. Gifts. In Greek, gifts is charismata, which if you know anybody uh, uh, near you named charis, you might know that charis means grace. So charismata is from the root of grace. So you could think of gifts as graces. They're the graces of God that that extend to you. Gifts are, are God's grace given to you. The varieties of gifts with the same spirit. The varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. And so we have one God in three persons giving to one family of God many gifts. Catch that? One God, three persons giving to one family of God, many gifts. And those gifts are are not meant to fracture us, but to pull us together. He emphasizes his point in verse seven. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Your gifts have been given to you for the common good. I've, I've shared this before. One of the gifts that we give our kids on Christmas is a gift to give away. It's a cash gift that they can kind of choose who they want to give that gift to. Wherever kind of they feel led. It's a gift to give away. This is what the gifts of the Spirit are. It's a gift for you, but for the family of faith. It's not for you. It's to be used by you to bless other people. It's for the common good. And he continues then, and he begins to explain the gifts. Now, he's going to explain the gifts two different chunks in 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to read those. Let me me give you some categories before I read those. So, because... It, it kind of just kind of comes at you fast, and you're like, what? how do I make sense of all of those, right? Let me kind of give you kind of three different types of gifts that you'll hear kind of expressed throughout Paul expressing this list of gifts. You're going to hear gifts of shepherding, gifts that involve leadership, things like wisdom and teaching, shepherding gifts. You're going to have gifts of service, gifts of things like hospitality or giving. And then you're going to have other gifts that are called like faith gifts. These tend to kind of have more kind of a miraculous tinge to them. Gifts of faith are in there. Gifts of healing or tongues also are included those gifts. So you have these three kind of class, classes of gifts. And one other thing before I begin to jump into this, this list of gifts. It's interesting, Paul has several times he gives us different types of gifts of the Spirit. And in fact, we're even gonna see here in this passage, you're gonna see kind of one set of gifts and you're gonna see an overlap with the other set. There's gonna be certain ones that overlap. And then he's gonna say, at different places, he's gonna give us other gifts. It's our contention that actually none of those lists of gifts is supposed to be kind of the be-all, end-all of every single gift we have. The Spirit of God is creative, and so you might even read these gifts, and we actually have lists of those gifts available if you want to grab those after the service out on the first step table. you, You can read through those, and you're like, I'm not quite sure if any of these fit me, and they might not, because the Spirit of God might have given you something that's a little bit different than on, that's on that list. So let's, let's pick up the list and let's begin to read. Verse eight. For to one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another 
prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who portions to each one individually as he wills. The spirit of God gives the gifts as he wills. We we don't get to like raise your hand. You're not like in a, you know, in in line at the cafe and we get to raise our line. I'll I'll take uh, discerning between spirits, you know. I'll take uh, some wisdom over here, right? No, he gives us those gifts as he wills for our good and for the good of the body of Christ. Let me pick up in verse 27 and forward the second time in the same chapter, Paul gives us gifts of lift. And really, listen to these, and again, hear, hear the different types, the shepherding, the service, and then the gifts of faith. Paul continues in verse 27. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Of course, the answer to all of those questions is no. So the spirit of God gives us gifts and he doesn't give us all the gifts. This is why there is one Jesus Christ who has all of the gifts, and then we collectively are the body of Christ. And so we need one another. We need the gifts that he's given to those around us. So gifts of shepherding, gifts of serving, and gifts of faith. Let me me run down a little rabbit trail here through the gifts of faith, because my hunch is that there's some questions probably stirring in your mind. What do we do with some of those gifts? They sound a little odd. Let me first address this. What do we make of the miraculous gifts? And I'll just start here by saying there's, there's differing opinions by godly and faithful Christians on this matter. There are some Christians who believe that that God gave the early church miraculous gifts to kind of birth the church, to explode the church right out of the gate. And then after what we call the apostolic age, after the first generation passes, then those gifts could go away. And that's possible. We here at New Life would hold a position where where we believe actually those, those gifts continue on. We believe that God continues to work miraculously. Now you might be saying, but I haven't seen that. And I would answer that in a couple ways. One is, I do think God works differently in different cultures. We live in a culture that is, if not immune from the supernatural, at least resistant to the supernatural. We we give answers of, of, of how things might have happened. And it's, it's hard to disentangle the supernatural sometimes. Someone goes to the doctor and is getting help and then they get better. Well, was it the doctor? Was it God? How, was it God using the doctor? It's hard to disentangle these things. It's hard for God to kind of fully get the credit, fully get the glory. But we believe God continues to work miraculously. We believe that, that we can pray for God to intervene miraculously. That God is not hindered by our, by our expectations. And that God can, can work miraculously without doctors. God can use doctors to work miraculously. And ultimately, God will work miraculously in the life of every believer. All will be healed ultimately in the new heavens and the new earth. And we believe God continues to work that way here. Just this week, we were, we've been praying for one of uh, our son's friend's dad who had a medical um, condition and it looked like this was gonna be something that was with him for a very long time is what the doctors said. And then overnight, he woke up and it was completely gone this week. Completely gone. Amazing. And, and I would say, I believe God intervened. Now, maybe God intervened through, through the doctors, 
but I don't know, it looked like God intervened. The, God, the, the doctors didn't expect this to happen. I also think that, that God, God works miraculously and tends to work miraculously more in places where the clarity of his glory is made manifest. And so for instance, in the global south, I think that God tends to work more miraculously in the developing world. So obviously, you, you might know this, we have an entwined relationship with ministry in India that we love to support and we go there every year. And I'll tell you a story from our past trip just a few weeks ago, but it's a story that represents many, many of these stories. And so this pastor shares about how he came to faith. He grew up in a radical Hindu home, worshiping the Hindu gods. His mother became deathly ill. And they couldn't figure out what was going on to her, with her. They, they took her to a doctor. The doctor couldn't cure her. They began to take her to different Hindu temples. And at each place, she was not healed. And ultimately, then a Christian family said, come to us, come visit our church with us. We worship the one true God and we believe he can heal you. And sure enough, God did. Miraculously intervened, intervened, the woman was healed. Her entire family comes to faith. And now her son is serving as a pastor. We believe that the God works miraculously and he does so for the benefit of his church and he does so for his own glory. Second, as we continue down this little, what do we do with these faith type gifts? Let's ask this question. What about the gift of tongues? What about the gift of tongues? You might've had some experience in your life with the gift of tongues. Maybe you grew up in a charismatic tradition where that was a common occurrence in the context of church. Maybe you never, you, you like seen it on TV or something. And that's just kind of this weird other world out there for you. What, what about the gift of tongues? Did the gift of tongues exist? Well, let me, let me provide here at New Life, we believe there's, there's possibility of two interpretations of this. And I want you to hear, hear all of these things. Like, please hear these things with the greatest humility. But the claim is not that we have this all down here at New Life. Like, we're trying to seek out the scriptures, trying to kind of understand what God says in these places and hopefully doing so with humility and recognition that like, we're trying to be as faithful as we can to the word of God. So what about tongues? Well, uh, most who believe in the ongoing gift of tongues believe that it, there's at least one gift of tongues. The gift that we see present at Pentecost, for example, where, where a human language is spoken. You know, Peter didn't learn Ethiopian, but all of a sudden, like, those who are present are hearing Ethiopian speaking. And God is using, uh, in the context of human language, a miraculous uh, transformation of that language so that it, it is heard by the hearer as the language of their uh, native tongue. That's one gift of tongues. It's possible there's a second gift of tongues. You might have heard it referred to as a, a heavenly tongues or angelic tongues. And it's possible that, that this gift of tongues is, is not a human language, but it's a language that's a, a heavenly language not understood by human beings. Now, in either case, what seems clear, if you, and I encourage you to do this, explore, pick back up 1 Corinthians 12, keep reading through 1 Corinthians 13. I'll hit that at the very end of this sermon, actually, just a little bit. And then head into 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul begins to give some explanation and definition. Here's how, here's how this should play out within the context of the church. And here's some basic guidelines. He says, listen, the, these gifts are to be used decently and in order. Like God is a God of order. He's, he's not a God of, of disruption. It's supposed to be decently in order because, because part of what had been happening in the context of the church at Corinth is like, these, these gifts were being used and unbelievers were like, whoa, this is weird. Like, get me away from these weirdos, right? They're like, no, 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 no. It's to be done decently in order and it's to be interpreted. It's to be interpreted. And so if, 
if the gift of tongues is used, it's, it's, it's used for the common good, not just for the speaker, but for the common good. And so it's to be, used, to be interpreted and then built up in the body of Christ. So what does that look like here in New Life? Well, here at New Life, kind of here's kind of the basic parameters in the context of like a large, a corporate worship setting like this. It'd be different in the context of a small group. Uh, if you have that question, I'd be happy to, to talk to you about that. But in the context of a large group like this, if somebody feels as though I'm being led by the Spirit of God to speak in tongues, then uh, you'd come and speak to probably Pastor Greg or myself or an elder, and we would kind of just vet, like, is this someone who's trustworthy in the body, body who has a reputation, you know, that, that's accountable? And then we need that gift to be interpreted. So is there someone who can interpret uh, the tongue that is being spoken? So that's kind of how that plays out in this context. All of these gifts... All of these gifts are used for the building up of the body of Jesus Christ. And all of these gifts are, are purposed to pull us together, to unite us together. And that's what Paul then continues to say in verse 12 and following. He says this. I don't think we have the rest of these verses on the screen, uh, just so you're aware. Uh, we had an issue with the software. So follow me, okay? Okay. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in, the, in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. Here's what Paul is saying. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, has the spirit of God come into you? Yes, Absolutely. Have you also come into the spirit? Yes, you have. And not just alone, you have come together. You have been collectively dunked as a follower of Jesus Christ, as the family of God, in the spirit of God. And as those who are being held in the spirit, united in the spirit, we are bound together as one. The spirit of God, you see, is not just about us and ourselves and what I get in my own individual relationship with God. What are the special places where the spirit of God gives me a bump? No, it's about the baptism, the unity of the family of God. He continues in verse 14. And now he begins to talk about the, the challenges here of envy and of pride and of, of putting others down and of looking at others who have gifts that you're like, wow, I wish I had that gift. Here's what he says, verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. So in other words, right? Like uh, one commentator pointed this out. I love this. He's like, notice how Paul uses the foot and the hand. They're kind of similar, right? Like, like, like the hand's like the northernmost foot, the foot's the southernmost hand, right? Like they're, they're kind of similar, right? He's like, it's interesting that, isn't this like the human way that we look at the person who's like just a little bit above us, right? So you're a foot. You're like, man, I wish I was a hand. I wish you didn't cover me in this thing. Like, nobody can even see me down here, right? And we look to the ones a little bit better. He does the same thing with the ear and the eye. He continues. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less part of the body. And if an ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? Anybody else like like pop up in your brain, those like commercials with the big nose, the person who turns into a nose. That's what I picture here, right? It's kind of fun. Like Paul's being silly here, right? Like big eye walking around, right? Like one big ear. He's like, that's goofy. That's silly. We need each other. You are not dispensable. I would like my foot to stay here. Even if my foot wants to be a hand, 
I'm really grateful it's not a hand. That would be weird if I had a hand on my leg, right? So don't, don't diminish the gifting that God has given you. Don't, don't look above you, oh, if only. That's okay. That person has been given those gifts for the good of the body anyways. It's not about them. And you have been given gifts that the body of Christ needs in you. You are indispensable. All of you. He continues. But as it is, God arranged them as members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts yet one body. And now he's going to flip it the other way. And don't look down on those that you think have a gifting that's below your level. He continues, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Not again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members who have the same care for one another, that if one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Do you, you pick up what he's saying there? Honor each other. You see somebody with a gift, speak words of encouragement into them. I'm so grateful for you. Like I, I hope words of encouragement are being spoken into our amazing children's team every Sunday. Thank you. You are incredible. Children's teachers, we love you and we're so grateful for you. The tech team, the, the, the first impression, like this is the... This is the body of Christ at work, and this is how it's supposed to be. This is why I love what we did last Sunday. I'm so, so grateful that we have a church with, with a heart for our community like it does. And I'm so grateful to be part of a church with so many diverse gifts. I hope, I hope you were here last Sunday. It was, it was awesome. Like, it was amazing to see your heart for the community for Quail Run and serving with such an amazing heart. And if you were here, what happened was kind of wild. It was, it was actually a surprise to those even in charge. So like all during the week, you had people in the body here with, with gifts and contractors and stuff who were getting stuff from the quarry and it was raining and it was hard to, like, to, to schedule. And then you had people kind of mapping out the trail and painting the trail and dumping the little things and preparing uh, the, the little notes that we're gonna write to the teacher, all this stuff. So if you were here, we went up to the track and then like, poof, it was like 10 minutes and it's like, practically spread. You're like, how did that happen? Well, I'll tell you how that happened. It wasn't because of me. Because we have amazing people with gifts that we're serving together and that's what the body of Christ serving together looks like. We have people with eyes to see the teachers up there. I mean, God bless you, public school teachers, right? February is a long month. <laughs> Praise God for rodeo break next week. <laughs> God bless Tucson, rest of the country, no rodeo break. We got rodeo break, right? So, but you have eyes to see. And so we're, we're speaking encouragement, love, and hope into them and the meaningful work that they're doing. This is the body of Christ functioning together. And we need everyone. We need everyone. So what do we do with this? Where do we land this? Let me take us to three conclusions, three practical applications. And the first is really an application for the entirety of the series. So we have six weeks. We're going to have six weeks on the Holy Spirit, and then we'll get to Resurrection, resurrection Day. On Easter Sunday, we'll have a different sermon, a resurrection-focused sermon on that day. But in this time of preparation, I would just invite you to consider fasting. Would you consider fasting? Actually, this... Past Wednesday began kind of the Lenten season, which is odd, happened on Valentine's Day. 
That messed with people's minds. Uh, and the Lenten season is, is a beautiful season. It actually predates even the Roman Catholic Church. It's been happening since the second century of the Christian community. A time of preparation, a, tri- a time of withholding from this world to consume on Christ. The way that we oftentimes say it here at New Life is we are contributors, not consumers. And fasting, what it does is it withholds us for our cons- from our consumption of the world so that we can be drawn into Christ, drawn into the spirit of God. And that would be my prayer, was that we collectively as a community would, would say, what are the things that I'm gonna re- withdraw on? Because I want to be available for the work of God in my life. Now, fasting is traditionally about food. So I'd encourage you to consider if, if this is a, a food fast for you. Maybe once a week, you wanna, you wanna fast from food. Maybe one meal a day, you wanna fast from food. Or maybe it's a type of food that you're like, yeah, I'm a little bit too connected to those sweets in my life right now, or a little too connected to alcohol. Like, what, what are those places where you need, to, you need to pull away and consume on the only one who satisfies? I also think it's legitimate in our consumptive world, we consume everything in our world to pull away from other things. Maybe it's just like, we need the, we need the screen turned off. You know, we need to, let's cut the streaming service for the month or social media. What, what are those things that are pulling you away, that are numbing your mind, that are cutting you off from the presence of God? I encourage you to open yourself up as we prepare for that amazing, glorious day where our Savior goes into the grave and rises again. Let us have hearts eager, eager for the Spirit of God for us in that time. So first, I encourage you to fast. Second, I encourage you to know your gifts. Know your gifts. Now some of you, you already know your gifts and I am so glad that you do. That's That's fantastic. But what about the rest? Or what if you're like, well, I maybe know my gifts-ish? Well, let me provide a few different opportunities for you to kind of step in and kind of know your gifts. First, I already said it. Uh, Maureen on the first, uh, the first step table out on the patio, she has a list of, of the, the gifts that are listed in scripture. Again, not that I, I even think that, that there's not lifts, gifts beyond that list. But that's a place to start and, and prayerfully begin considering, what, what are my gifts? What am I made for? I encourage you to use community. I think community is such an important place for, for us to have this discernment. There's those of us who have, who have such, who, who just tend to beat ourselves up and we just don't even see what we contribute anywhere. You need people to speak hope and value into you, around you. This is what I see as your gifts. Then there's others of us who, who our tendency is to choose the gifts that we, we would like to have, but maybe don't have. Again, community is helpful in that. I see, I hear you saying this, and that's a wonderful gift, but, but what are the gifts God has given you? What has he given you? I also encourage you, we actually have a, a process here to, to navigate that. It's, it's out, it's past Easter. It's on April 13th, because we actually just had one. It's called Unwrapped, and Maureen and her team do a wonderful job of kind of just navigating this process through you. But what are your gifts? What has God made you for? What is he inviting you into? Third, use your gifts. Use your gifts. Fast, Know your gifts. Use your gifts. What, what does that look like? Well, it means, it means stepping up to the plate. It means creating space in your life so that you can do what God has made you for. The Spirit of God has given you a gift. Steward that gift for the good of the people of God. Use that gift. Now, I would also just say, if at the end of the day, you're still like, I don't even, I still don't really know what my gifts are. Let's just start serving. Start serving. It, it's a wonderful thing to be able to, to just step in and just feel where you're used by God. You might surprise yourself. 
You might be like, okay, I'll be on the first impressions team. That feels a little awkward. And all of a sudden you're like, you know what? That wasn't so bad. It's nice to be nice. You might, you might find out that you like children. You might, you might find out that, that there's a passion in your heart that you didn't even know was there. That's part of gifting, by the way, those passions that you have, that God is, the, the causes that God has directed you, the experiences, that's all part of what God has done in you. It's not an accident. So start serving. I just want to say this, New Life. Like I, w- I wish I could give you the gift of seeing you the way that I see you. Because we have a phenomenal community. A community that's serving in so many ways. People making meals for others, visiting other people in their grief, visiting people in a hospital. This incredible children's team that loves these kids so, so well. We have, we have people in the, in the, in the realm of, of foster and adoptive care that are opening up their homes to foster kids who are coming alongside to support families in foster care. We have people here working at Gospel Rescue Mission. We have, we have people with, with technological skills that are, that are cutting and, and editing and sending out. Like We have an incredible people with, who are using varied gifts in so many different ways, ways that I could never come up with. I encourage you to be part of that. Don't miss out on that. And what is this all for? Where does this all lead? For the common good. For the, for the building up, for the, for the uniting in love of the family of God. This is where Paul takes us in chapter 13. You, you probably know 1 Corinthians 13. You probably heard it at like a, a wedding before. It's a love chapter that's directly following this chapter. Here's where Paul lands this chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. Our gifts, the, the charismata, the graces given to us by God are to be used as the overflow and the, to pour out in the building up of the love of the family of God. This is God's purposes for us. What good are our gifts if they're for us? What good are our gifts if they're for our own personal, personal edification and the building up of me? They're of no good but they're of great good if they're poured out for the purpose and the destination and the building up of the love of the people of God. The Holy Spirit is a giver of gifts. He has given you gifts so that you may pour them out and build up the love of the family of God. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful for your work within us. We are so grateful, Lord, that you meet us, that you, Spirit of God, are the giver of gifts in our lives. Lord, help us to see, to unwrap, to know what those gifts are. May we be those who are propelled by the love of Jesus Christ to love those in our circles, the gift of the love of Jesus Christ and the graces that he has given us. It's in your name we pray, amen.